Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a special COVID-19 update on the Delta variant. Thank you for joining us during your lunch hour. We have a very full agenda for you, and we'll be mindful of your time today. My name is Katie Pryor, Chief Development Officer and SVP of Member Engagement for the Greater Houston Partnership. The partnership is committed to being a trusted resource for our business community and beyond. Throughout the pandemic, we've felt a heightened obligation to bring you relevant, up-to-date information. Your business is important to us and critical to the work that the partnership does on behalf of the greater Houston region. Thank you again for taking part in this important conversation. Today's webinar has a fantastic lineup of speakers, including partnership president and CEO, Bob Harvey. We'll focus our conversation on the current state and impacts of the Delta variant with the intent to bring our members additional updates and content over the coming weeks. As an organization, we will continue to evaluate the risks of the new variant on the public's health and adjust our own event safety protocols as needed. In the meantime, we strongly encourage those attending our events to wear masks and especially those unvaccinated or with special health concerns. Now, I will turn it over to President and CEO Bob Harvey, who will give us an update on the status of COVID in our region and uh, introduce our guests. So Bob, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Katie, and thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, as Katie said, I'm Bob Harvey. I'm President and CEO of the partnership. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. You know, over the last 14 or 15 months, you know, we've offered, I'd say, countless webinars and a lot of written content regarding the pandemic and how businesses might respond. And we've heard from medical experts, uh, legal experts at times, uh, a number of business leaders on the topic. Frankly, I was hoping that our conversations about COVID were largely over, uh, but unfortunately, we're here today to talk about this latest spike caused by the Delta variant, as Katie mentioned, what we're calling the fourth wave which suggests that we all need to pause and frankly recalibrate where we are and what we're doing as employers and as business leaders relative to the, to the virus. Uh, over the past few weeks, you've undoubtedly read about the growing concern about the Delta variant. Uh, coupled with slowing vaccination rates, this very infectious strain of COVID is uh, posing quite a threat. And I'll share some data in just a minute. But it calls on the business community to look carefully at our return to work plans, our vaccination policies, our protocols for in-person gatherings, you name it, in light of this fourth wave. Uh, following our panel discussion, we will take questions from the audience. So if, if you have a question you'd like to submit to our panelists as we move through the agenda, just enter it into the Q&A section, and we'll do our best to get to all those uh, towards the last 10 or 15 minutes of the program. So momentarily, I will introduce the panelists joining us for today's discussion. But before I do that, I'd like to just share some of the critical metrics that the Texas Medical Center produces uh, that we've been tracking since the start of the pandemic. So let's go to the first one. And um, this is the daily new COVID cases in the greater Houston area averaged over a week. So this is really weekly data, um, but it's the average of daily cases. We talk about the fourth wave. You look at this chart and you might see the beginning of what looks like a third wave. Well, this chart, we didn't start producing this chart at the TMC till the 1st of June. So the first wave was way back in March and April of last year. Uh, you recall how frightened, frightening it was. We didn't know much about COVID at the time, uh, but we ended the first wave rather abruptly by sending everyone home from work. And uh, Places of worship stopped holding services on the weekends and what have you. The second wave developed over the summer of 20. Of course, the third wave was this past winter. But with the vaccine and the growing number of people that have had antibodies from having had the virus, we were on a great trajectory until just a few weeks ago. But look at those last three weeks and the rate of increase we're seeing in the number of cases. So we're now at over 1,000 new daily cases in, in Houston uh, for the last week. Let's go to the next slide. You know, the significance of this is, you know, they're now appearing in the hospitals as COVID patients in our hospitals. So with a little bit of a lag to the new cases, we're now seeing a very dramatic uptick in the number of COVID hospitalizations. Again, this is a daily average, averaged over a week. This is that last bar there is the average for the week ending Sunday. And uh, yesterday's data point 
was 245 new hospitalizations. That's just a one day data point. But what it shows you is that we're still on a very steep upward trajectory when it comes to COVID hospitalizations. I'll say quickly, and others will comment on the fact that these are largely unvaccinated Houstonians that are presenting at the hospital with COVID. Um, far and away, the majority are unvaccinated individuals that are presenting at the hospital now with COVID. So we'll come back to that thought. Let's go to the next slide. It takes this issue of patients, COVID patients in the hospital. Now, rather than talking about new daily admissions, this is the total number of COVID patients in our hospital, uh, the TMC hospitals, and this is daily data. And so you see the very rapid uptick in the number of COVID patients in our hospitals. And what's concerning is not just the darker blue at the bottom, which are the so-called med surge, the standard hospital rooms, but the big jump in ICU usage here, particularly over the last week or so. So you see, you know, cases predate hospitalizations and med surge tends to predate ICU use. But if you'll see there on the right hand of this slide, it says that the daily average growth rate for ICU use is now 7.6% over the last seven days, 7.2% for med surge. Many of you know the simple math. If something is growing at 7% per day, it means it doubles every 10 days. So we're now at a very scary, steep part of the curve. You see that at the bottom of the slide in that you know, relative to the previous peaks, we're seeing a rate of growth in hospitalizations, not dissimilar to last summer, uh, which was really the so-called second wave, which, which, which was the scariest of the waves in terms of the steepness uh, of the curve. So that's a little background. Um, in similar sessions to this, uh, I've often handed the floor to Dr. Eric Borwinkle, and I always tell Eric to please correct anything I've said that's wrong, and he always will, and he'll amplify it, I know, in many ways. Uh, Dr. Borwinkle is the Dean and Chair of Public Health at the UT Health Science Center School of Public Health. It's a statewide responsibility that Eric has, uh, but he's right here in Houston. And really since the very first case of COVID-19 here in Houston, Eric and his team at UT Health School of Public Health have been a tremendous resource. And he's been part of the TMC discussions that um, you know, we were having them twice a week there for a while, Eric. Now we're back you know, having them once a week. Um, but let me just say thank you for the time this morning. And let me give you the floor and then we'll, we'll move on to other panelists. Thank you, Eric. Sure, thank you. And very much thank you for the invitation. I certainly appreciate it. I've had the honor of working with local public health and public health authorities and also the TMC institutions and kind of carrying out granular analyses of the data in our community and then presenting it back to the many, many stakeholders, including the business community. So this is really a, an honor and a, and a pleasure for me. I'm gonna share my screen if you'll just um, bear with me for one minute while I do that. So I'll walk through, hopefully not too quickly and not too slowly. As I said, we've, we've had the advantage of working basically with numbers from our, our hospital partners and also with, in this particular case, Harris County Public Health, and you'll be hearing more from them later uh, and, and looking at uh, basically the COVID pandemic, focusing primarily um, on the greater Houston area. The slide on the right shows you really data documenting. We are indeed officially in a fourth wave. Um, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but basically this is that early blip um, back in March and April of 2020. This would be the July peak, uh, December, January. And here we find ourselves really in a, in a fourth wave or fourth peak, um, unfortunately. This, this wave, though, is different from the others in a variety of ways. Um, number one, it's primarily a wave in young adults. I'll, I'll use that word. The slide on the left comes from Harris County Public Health, looking at positive tests, really, in, in our community. And you can see the largest group, really, is 20 to 39 years old. Um, as Bob indicated, it, it right now is a pandemic primarily in unvaccinated individuals. And it's really a profound um, observation, depending on details of how you slice the data. It, it's always north of 90% of individuals who are being uh, diagnosed with COVID are unvaccinated. It goes actually as high as 98 or 99%. 
So this is largely right now, this fourth wave is largely a pandemic in unvaccinated individuals. And I am going to pause at this point and encourage everyone. I don't want to proselytize, but I want to encourage everyone to get vaccinated. Um, some of the rumors and you know things you might hear that this vaccine was rushed and therefore is not safe is simply not true. Um, companies such as BioNTech and Moderna have been working on RNA vaccines literally for decades. And we're very fortunate for that strong foundation of science that was allowed us to get really a vaccine for COVID um, quickly. Other things about, you know, that it, it um, affects one's fertility. There's absolutely no data to support that it um, affects an individual's fertility. And I think that's been a particular concern with parents of, of young children want to make sure um, that's not, you know, affecting future generations. Again, there's no support. Um, the, the RNA does not uh, integrate into your genome and or any other way that we can track you going forward. I think that's another misnomer that we, we need to just dispel. There is the association with basically inflammation of the heart, myocarditis, but I do want to emphasize that it's rare. And if you compare the risk of vaccine-induced myocarditis to the risk of cardiac complications from getting COVID, um, basically, the, the vaccine-induced myocarditis is rare and the, and the risk is small relative to um, getting COVID. And I also think one other um, sort of rumor we need to dispel is this idea that since young people don't get sick, therefore, it doesn't matter. You know, one of the things we're unfortunately learning is the long-term consequences of COVID. They can be heart-related consequences, cognitive or, you know, school performance consequences, kidneys, so, and, and behavioral issues. So we really do need to protect our young people from this infection um, going forward. I get asked a lot about, you know, is this fourth peak going to be as bad as the second and third one? I mean, the short answer is I don't know. Um, on the left, it actually compares the acceleration. So if you think of basically how, you know, just like your automobile acceleration, how does the acceleration of the fourth wave compare to the second and third? The fourth is that solid gold um, bar. The second was the orange dashed and the third was the gray dashed lines. And you can see this fourth wave purely in terms of acceleration is about the same. It's right in between the second and the third. So far, at least, if we look at the ratio of inpatients to outpatients, um, there tends to be fewer individuals getting sick and ending up um, as inpatients in the hospital or, heaven forbid, being in the ICU or even passing away. So right now, we're not seeing the incredible pressure on health care that we saw, uh, particularly in the second and third wave. Um, so, But again, it's important that we stay vigilant. The bottom line is you don't want to get COVID. As you've heard um, a lot, uh, this fourth wave is primarily attributable really to two things. Um, one is us letting our guard down a bit in terms of distancing and mask wearing. Um, and the other is the emergence of the so-called Delta variant. Um, it, it's known also by B1617-2 for sort of the geeks in the audience. Um, the, the data on the left, that graph comes from uh, Jim Musser at Methodist Hospital. And you can see the Y or the X axis, I'm sorry, is, is days, days since um, April the 15th tax day. Um, and the increase really of, of the Delta variant is a proportion of all of the other strains of COVID-19. And incredibly, basically, in let, let's say approximately 90 days since the emergence of Delta in our community, it's gone from practically 0% up now, it's just touching 90% um, of, the, of the variants in our community um, look like they're Delta. I didn't wanna give a lecture about the Delta variant, so here's just a bulleted list of seven things that I think we should all know about it. One, it is a lot more contagious. Basically, the, 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 it, it reproduces more in your nasal passages ends up in a higher concentration in droplets, and it just is more contagious because of those things. 
Um, unvaccinated people are at great risk um, for this variant. It's, it's almost like a bird dog. It, it has the ability of finding unvaccinated bit of people and infecting them. So keep that in mind. Breakthrough infections are, are in the news a lot, um, and we analyze very carefully breakthrough infections, both um, symptomatic, and it's probably not the right use of the word, but people who have been vaccinated that still have virus. And I'll, I'll just say for now that they're infrequent. It's, it's a difficult thing um, actually to estimate uh, in gr with great precision, but there, I, I am safe in saying that they're infrequent. Because of the sort of epidemiology of the way this um, virus can infect quickly other individuals, we can all expect basically high, what I'm calling hyper -lo local outbreaks. Um, I, I don't think I like that word super spreading events. They're probably not a single event. I think we're going to see um, in our community the, these hyper local outbreaks in areas that have low vaccination rates and where there were spreading events. And I'll, I'll show you a map later of vaccination rates. There's still a lot we don't know. Um, you know, I think COVID has taught me to be, be a bit, um, you know, humble uh, about what we know and what we don't know. And I'm here to safely tell you, there's just a lot we don't know is, you know, is it, does it cause more severe disease? We don't know, that's an example. And so I'll, I'll just end vaccines, your best protection. And then give you a little advice from Eric. Um, this is not official CDC advice at this time. Uh, my advice when I'm asked um, over the last couple of weeks is to avoid crowded indoor areas and spaces. And if you must go, just please wear a mask. And that advice is true whether you're vaccinated or you're not vaccinated. Um, again, if you can avoid indoor crowded spaces, please do it. And if you have to go, um, wear a mask, please. Uh, here's a little more data, um, basically of test positivity rate um, in our community. And I, I just circle on the top by age group just to emphasize again, this fourth wave tends to be a, a wave that's predominantly in, in fairly young people. Um, you can see, for example, right in the middle, 20 to 29 year olds, their test positivity rates approximately 8%. Um, if you wonder why it's different, I, I doubt, although it's hard to prove, I doubt it's because the virus is mutated um, and more likely to go to younger people. I think it's primarily because the older folks um, like me are just more vaccinated and we're also tending to avoid um, crowds. The other comment is on the lower half of the slide. Um, if you look back at the July peak and the January peak, COVID had a disproportionate burden in the Hispanic community. And now we're seeing that um, it basically is um, across the major race groups of African-Americans, Hispanics, and non-Hispanic whites. In fact, if you look at certain slices of the data, um, whites tend to have the highest um, case rates. I wanna comment about children a little bit. You know, I mean, children represent our future. That's not a cliche, it's a fact. Um, the slide on the left is really national data. So this is now across the whole United States. It's, you know, the case numbers are still quite low in, in children, partly because they're asymptomatic. They don't get tested a lot, but this just shows you all the way to the right. You can see that uptick. So the fourth wave definitely is present in young people. Um, and and we, we are monitoring very closely what's happening in, in young people. On the right-hand side is data from the Texas Medical Center. Um, the red are outpatients and the, the green are inpatients. And notice the great disparity between outpatients and inpatients. We're fortunate, again, that um, children are not getting as sick once they, even if they have symptomatic COVID, they tend to be treated as outpatients and that's what's shown in red. But we still do have um, inpatient COVID cases um, they tend to be, you know, in the 20s typically in our area. Um, so, we, but again, we watch it. But it, I, I do want to emphasize, though, that that idea that we just because they're not inpatients and not very sick, that we can't just conclude that we don't need to worry about it because of the long-term consequences of COVID. This is kind of a cute and cool slide. It, it just shows you in in um, in one color 
basically what's happening in the Texas Medical Center and in another color what's happening in, in our community. And I'm not going to go through it in any detail, but it's very interesting to see that the what's happening in the community tends to mirror and, and predict what's happening in, in the Texas Medical Center. Um, the, the graph itself is a little out of date. The test positivity rate in our community right now is about nine point something percent. So I'm gonna shift gears just a little bit and talk about the vaccine. I, I tried to dispel some untruths about the vaccine. Um, this is a map of Harris County, I think most of you know, and Jennifer Kiger will give you more up-to-date um, information about the vaccine rate in Harris County. She's an absolute expert in the topic. Um, but I, I wanna emphasize not that average rate, but talk about the differences geographically and amongst individuals. The blue color means those are areas, these are zip codes, by the way. The blue areas are areas of our county that are more vaccinated. And that salmon colored or even red are areas that are less vaccinated. I just wanted to point out that Northeast quadrant of our community um, tends to be people of color. It tends to be people who suffer both food and transportation insecurity, and they're having lower vaccination rates. And the area basically from the Texas Medical Center, Westview, Bel Air, um, out towards Memorial, sort of that I-10 corridor, south of the I-10 corridor, out into Katy, tend to be areas that are more highly vaccinated. And I'm also gonna take advantage of this slide to dispel another um, untruth or rumor. You know, you, I always hear at cocktail parties that the institutions of the Texas Medical Center and the Texas Medical Center and our local public health agencies are not working well together. That's just simply not the case. I, I've experienced early on literally daily and now certain multiple times weekly where the groups are working, you know, hand in glove really to make sure we're getting the best health care and make sure we're doing the best we can to get vaccines into arms, especially those arms that are most in need. I'm going to end here with a little bit of a positive note. You know, it's some of these kind of slideshows or talks of COVID, I think they can kind of turn into a bit of a downer. Um, this slide actually shows how, what proportion of us in Texas, this is a Texas data now, um, have antibodies against the virus. And you can get antibodies two different ways. One is you can get them because you've been exposed to the virus. You may even been diagnosed with COVID. And the other way is with the vaccine. The dotted line that increases here, those are vaccination rates. And the dashed line, and this, this data, by the way, starts with the new year. The dashed line are antibodies due to people who've been exposed to the virus. In fact, you notice the uptick right at the end. It actually keeps going up one more week. Um, that is wave four. When you combine those two, and it's not simple to combine them, you just can't add them because some people have both and you can't double count them. Today, approximately 73% of the Texas population has antibodies against um, the SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. Then the next question is, well, shoot, Eric, how long do those antibodies last? If I have antibodies, am I gonna need a shot every six months or whatever? This is a bit of a, basically a shotgun blast. Every, every point here is an individual over time. And the x-axis is numbers of days since you tested positive for COVID. And the line is sort of an average, asking the question, on average, how often do those antibodies last? And I'm happy to say that there's reasonable data that if you've been exposed or you've had the vaccine, um, these individuals are all been naturally exposed. Those antibodies are lasting at least one year, um, which to be honest, if, if I would have had to guess a year ago, the answer to that question, I don't think I would have predicted one year. Um, it is also interesting to note some people who have been exposed to the virus are not making antibodies. And um, it's actually a very active area of work in the group right now. What predicts that? We know some people have had transplants, active cancer patients. And I'm, you know, I, I can also report the, the aged basically um, don't have a robust antibody response. But again, I wanted to end, Bob, on a positive note that if you're if you have been exposed to the virus and you're, you do make antibodies, they're lasting about a year. 
So Bob, I'll turn it back over to you and and we can, I don't know if we're going to answer, you know, talk and answer questions at the end. Yeah, we'll, we'll put it to the end. Thank you so much, Eric. And uh, that was a lot of content. I have a lot of questions already, but let me, let me defer them to a little bit later in the program. Uh, I'd, I'd now like to welcome Dr. James McDivitt, James T. McDivitt to the call. Uh, Dr. McDivitt is the Executive Vice President and Clean, uh, Dean of Clinical Affairs at Baylor College of Medicine. And he also serves as the Chief Clinical Integration Office at uh, St. Luke's. So, uh, James, thanks so much for joining us. He's also part of the team that meets uh, now weekly, previously more frequently at the TMC. Um, James, I'm told you've reinstituted your blog, and the group probably doesn't appreciate the significance of that. But maybe you could start there, and then and then share your your other thoughts on the virus. Yeah, I will tell you, it is a sad, sad day, and uh, <clears throat> the. Uh, just to, I'll share my screen for just a second. So this is, this is what I've written over the past year uh, about COVID-19. And again, I'm not as smart as Dr. Borwinkle. Uh, I'm much, much simpler in my thought process. But what I've tried to do is every week write something from the viewpoint of the lay public that is accessible, that tries to explain things in terms that people can, can fairly easily understand. I've been doing it forever. Uh, and finally, down here at the bottom, you can see signing off. That, that was when life was good and it looked like this was behind us. I actually said, well, I'm not going to write this anymore because I got nothing left to say. And I, I had about four weeks off. And last week I wrote retirement was underrated. Uh, so I'm, I'm back in business now. And in the, in the chat, I'm going to put uh, uh, a link to my most recent posting. You can look on Twitter at, at Jay McDevitt. I'll put that in the chat or I'll give you my, uh, my website. Uh, but it's a, uh, I think it's a reasonable source to look at just to get a sense of sort of big picture what's going on in a, in a, in a typical, typical week. Uh, I will hit on a couple of the themes that Dr. Borwinkle uh, did. I'll try not to be highly repetitive because uh, he covered a lot of, uh, a lot of good information. Uh, I will disagree with him. I'm, I'm going to uh, shamelessly proselytize for getting vaccinated because I think that's the, the one path forward. And I think it's a critical message we need to get out there. I think that's a critical message for me and Dr. Warwinkle and Mr. Harvey and all of us uh, and all of you uh, to get out. Uh, I'll comment on just a couple of things on the Delta variant, uh, some, uh, some myths, and, and uh, again, Eric covered this uh, well, much more contagious. The original coronavirus we dealt with last summer uh, had uh, this famous R value, uh, the R value being the likelihood that I'm going to infect a number of other people. So if my R is two, and I get infected, statistically, I'm gonna infect two other people in the community. Well, the original coronavirus was something like an R of two, maybe 2.5. The R for Delta is probably more in the five to eight range. And that's getting into very, very contagious respiratory virus uh, territory. That means if I get it, all other things being equal, I walk out into the community, I'm likely to infect five, six, seven, eight other people. Uh, so it just sort of puts that in, in perspective. Again, the good news is Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J &J, still excellent protection against getting critically ill, winding up in a hospital, getting sick, uh, winding up in an ICU. So if you are vaccinated, if you're fully vaccinated, uh, walking around Houston, you don't have to worry too much about getting really sick. Now we have seen with the Delta variant, some weakening of the protection you get from catching it at all, uh, where we used to say it was 90 plus percent effective at catching coronavirus, numbers I've seen now, it's more in these uh, 70s to maybe 80% range, still very, very protective, still very good, but uh, you're, you're a little bit more likely to get it. And, uh, but if you do, and you're vaccinated, you're probably not going to get really sick. Uh, you, you might have bad cold, uh, bad flu sort of, uh, sort of symptoms. Uh, and importantly, we've talked about breakthrough uh, 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 infections. We have breakthrough infections. We always will. We always did. Uh, and even when we say a vaccine is 95% effective, another way of saying that is it's 5% ineffective. Uh, and it's a little bit complicated, but it gets to be more of a problem in the environment we're entering where there's a lot of prevalence of disease in the community. And the example I use to talk about that is if I'm in a room full of mosquitoes, well, let's say I'm in a room full with one mosquito in it. I'm sitting here in my office and there's one mosquito back in the corner and I'm wearing an insect repellent that is 95% effective, I'm probably not gonna get bitten. If my office has 10,000 mosquitoes swarming around it, and I have that same 95% effective uh, insect repellent, uh, repellent on, 
I, I probably am going to get bitten. And, that, and that's the problem when we start to see a lot more COVID in the community is you are equally protected. There's just a lot more opportunity to get infected. So I, that, that's part of the reason why uh, we have more breakthrough infections. A uh, couple of important points. Uh, one's maybe esoteric for this group, but uh, Regeneron is a treatment for COVID uh, using monoclonal antibodies, where we actually produce antibodies to the virus and, and give them to people intravenously. Regeneron is less effective against the Delta variant. So we're, we're, we are, one of our treatments is, is not quite as effective. Steroids still work very well. Uh, and importantly, there are a number of people in the community that got one dose of Pfizer or one dose of Moderna. And for the Delta variant in particular, that's essentially worthless. You, you have very limited protection against Moderna or Pfizer uh, with, the, with the one dose. Uh, and I'll, I'll make just a couple more points. One is people have started using the term, uh, including Dr. Fauci, uh, that this is the pandemic of the unvaccinated, the, 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 what we're entering right now. And I don't think that's a good way of thinking. I, I don't think this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. It's true that 95 plus percent of people being admitted to a hospital are unvaccinated, but this is also the pandemic of the people who can't be vaccinated, of the elderly frail whose immunity might be waning, of the kids less than 12 uh, that can't get vaccinated. Uh, it's a pandemic of the hospitals and healthcare providers who have been at this now for a year and a half without a break because it never has uh, let up. Frankly, it's the pandemic of businesses that really crave stability and a predictable environment so you can hire people and get back to work and start to lick your wounds over uh, from the past, uh, past year. So this pandemic is not a pandemic of the unvaccinated. It's a pandemic for everybody. And to that end, I would strongly encourage us to do anything we can do to encourage people to get vaccinated. Uh, I think the current crisis is going to drive some of that. I think people are taking notice that all these unvaccinated people are getting sick, and that I think is driving some people to get vaccinated. You're starting to see a groundswell of organizations starting in healthcare, but I think it'll spread to others uh, that are going to mandate vaccinations. And, and if, you, if you can mandate or strongly encourage, I would strongly encourage you to do so. And understand that's problematic for a, a number of businesses for, for many reasons and appreciate that. So I'm not preaching at you, but just do what you can to encourage vaccination, giving people time off uh, and, and maybe providing more carrots and uh, then sticks. Baylor will require vaccination uh, and we'll make that announcement uh, uh, this week. Uh, importantly, I think we all need to use our influence in our circle of friends and family uh, because it has gotten to the point that the public is not going to listen to a talking head on a TV show or a news station uh, and, convince, and be convinced that they should get vaccinated. They've, they've heard the data, they've heard the arguments. The ground war that needs to be fought is you talking to your cousin Joe, who just doesn't have the time to get vaccinated or is a little concerned about the side effects and really person by person exerting influence uh, to try and get uh, your, your friend, neighbor, colleague uh, vaccinate to, to, to exert that individual pressure. And to that end, the, the one uh, post I'll put on the chat when I finish talking is my last week, what I wrote last week, just a couple ideas about how to have that conversation. And one is data-driven. And I've, uh, I've developed a habit now of following Vermont and Alabama because uh, Vermont is our best vaccinated state and Alabama is our worst vaccinated state uh, uh, currently. Uh, and if you just look at the numbers, it's pretty, uh, pretty stunning and pretty illustrative. Uh, Vermont, 67% vaccination rate, Alabama, 42% fully vaccinated. When you look at cases in Alabama, uh, they're currently experiencing about 1,300 cases per day. In Vermont, they're currently experiencing 14 cases per day. Huge difference. When you look at hospitalizations, in Alabama, about 140 hospitalizations per week, 140. In, uh, in Vermont, it averages out to less than one hospitalization uh, per week. Uh, and deaths, there are five people dying every day in Alabama. Uh, nobody has died for several days to weeks uh, in, in, in Vermont. So very, very clear and compelling evidence that vaccination doesn't make a little difference. It makes a huge uh, difference. So that's an argument I've used with my friends and family. The second is more an exercise. And we, we sort of stink at risk benefit analysis and this talk about myocarditis and am I gonna get a, a, contra, a, a bad side effect from the, from the vaccine? We don't manage those facts and figures well in our head. 
So what I've asked people to start doing is more of an exercise. And I ask you to take out a piece of paper. Uh, you can do this virtually, uh, but, uh, but it, it, I think it's something good to do with your, 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 your friends. Uh, and on that piece of paper, write down the name, uh, you have to know their name, the name of everybody you know that has experienced a terrible outcome from getting vaccinated. And by that, I don't mean they had some uh, body aches or muscle soreness or low-grade fever or felt fatigued for a day or two. I mean, people that wound up in a hospital had a serious medical country, uh, med medical uh, problem uh, that were disabled in some way from the vaccine that had a serious medical problem. So prepare that list uh, and then sit down with a second piece of paper and write down all the people you know that had a serious outcome from COVID-19. Uh, that were in the hospital, uh, that were left with long-term disability, that had weeks or months of fatigue or brain fog or respiratory difficulty or decreased exercise tolerance or died. I can tell you when I do that exercise, I, I, I have zero names on my first list. I've got five names of people I know, people I know well on my second list. Uh, and if we repeated that across the 400 people on this call, we would probably have very, very few people on that first list and we would have literally hundreds of people on the second list. So I think it's a nice graphical way of getting people to think about risk benefit analysis in making that decision to take the plunge and actually get vaccinated. You are far, far more likely to have a bad outcome from COVID-19 uh, than you are from, uh, from vaccination. Uh, and I'll finish up by saying, stay tuned for the new CDC guidelines because they're gonna make some kind of announcement today at two, uh, probably related to masking probably encouraging masking in indoor spaces. Uh, and that obviously will have implications for business and, uh, and, and the, the signs you decide to post on your doors about uh, what you expect when people come into your places of business. So I will stop there, Bob. Well, James, thank, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll put that notice up. Two o'clock this afternoon, uh, CDC revised guidance uh, is gonna be coming out. Let me introduce our final two panelists. And then we'll bring the whole group back together. But let me introduce the final two. Jennifer Kiger is the chief of the Office of Public Health Preparedness and Response at Harris County Public Health. Uh, and in and, and her role, she oversees the county's work to develop and implement department-wide approaches to addressing COVID-19. And she's also part of our, our weekly call. She's our part of our call with the school district superintendents every week. She's part of our call with the faith community. So Jennifer, thanks for all you've done. Let me introduce our, our, our fifth panelist, and that's Mark Watts. He's president of the Friedkin Group, uh, best known, I guess, Mark, for owning Gulf Stage Toyota. You may say something you know, else in that regard. He's been a consistent leader of the partnerships COVID-19 efforts uh, for the last year and a half, but he also brings just a business leader's perspective to these conversations. Uh, so Jennifer, I thought we'd start with you and, and ask you to tell us a bit more about what Harris County Public Health has been doing particularly of late. I know there's a long history, but particularly of late and how you're addressing the surge brought about by the Delta variant. Sure, thank you so much for this opportunity and I'll keep it short because I know we want to save time for questions. But as you probably all know, in Harris County, we, we change our threat level to orange in anticipating this increase in cases and hospitalization. And one of the big things we want to stress is just the to encourage um, continued increases in vaccination and then also really encourage our everyone who's vaccinated or not to continue to wear masks indoors. We wanna try and mitigate the, the peak of this new wave. And so all our actions really uh, face that hurdle. So one thing that we have done um, since the onset is, is provide testing to everyone, um, free testing. We continue to have three test sites across the county, one at the east, one in the west, one in the central, and they're open five to six days a week. And we have seen an increase in testing with the increase in cases, and we still monitor all of the cases. We still do case investigations for the new variant and also for the breakthrough cases that Dr. Borwinkle mentioned. And we monitor all these metrics daily with our county judge, Lena Hidalgo. Um, one other thing we do is we provide vaccinations. We oversee the vaccination site at NRG that provides Pfizer and J&J, &J, and that is a six-day operation from 12 to 7. So if anyone needs that, that resource, please use it. We also have 10 mobile vaccination units open six days a week. So that is um, quite a few different um, events every day, and that, that's really for us to allow to get into the community um, 
address some of these barriers. It's more of a convenience issue that we're finding with the community members right now. The more convenient we can make the vaccine to them, the more likely they are to, to take it. And also like Dr. McDevitt said, it's about families and friends encouraging individuals to get vaccinated. So on that, we have partnered with a new vendor, um, Elevate Strategies, to um, do some outreach and education campaigns door to door to increase the understanding of what vaccinations are and that we are in the community often around the corner to really address those um, barriers and concerns. We also have transportation assistance that we provide people as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was our work with schools. Um, Bob kind of mentioned it a little bit, but we have been working really, really um, vigorously with our school partners, the independent school districts. And I know that having our kids in schools and, and being safe affects the business community. Um, so we work with Pam Wells, who's over the region for um, schools, and we've been providing guidance, resources, um, vaccination events. So we've had over 100 and close to 150 different events, um, unique events since May when the um, availability of the vaccine was lowered to 12 and up. And so we've been at middle schools, high schools, um, anything we can do to provide vaccinations. We also partner with other healthcare institutions as well. Um, what we did send out last week to all the superintendents was a request for them to help us encourage um, obviously, the staff members and the faculties to wear masks right now, universal masking, even though we, we can't mandate it, the schools can't mandate it, um, there's governor's orders in place, but we can still encourage it. And um, we know that the schools have uh, some hurdles to face and we want to help them and help you guys in how we can continue to um, have a successful year in our business and school community. We also provide these mobile vaccination events at businesses. So we may have actually partnered with some of you guys and we provide it to the business um, staff and also to the community when that's allowed. So if you need any assistance with getting vaccinations for your employees, please let us know. If you need any assistance with um, materials or resources, we will be happy to help you. Um, we would love to be one of your partners and continue to be partners with a lot of you that we've already partnered with. But with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Bob, and here to answer any questions. Well, thank you, Jennifer, and we'll come back to the questions in just a minute, but this is an opportunity for me to thank you, and Harris County has been so forthcoming, so aggressive in their attempts to get the vaccine out into people's arms all across the community, so thank you for your efforts. Mark, from the standpoint of a business person that's trying to manage through this, I mean, what have you been doing at Friedkin, and what are you considering now in light of the current circumstances? Well, thank you, Bob. Our objective, as I think the objective of almost all businesses, keep our uh, employees, associates safe first and foremost, uh, and then continue to, to run our businesses. We've been really very successful at that so far, uh, but I will say it's a get, a getting a lot more uh, uncertain in terms of the, uh, of the outlook. Uh, you know, our strategy lately just have just been how do we encourage our associates to get vaccinated? So we provided financial incentives. We give time off uh, from work. Um, we have on-site testing. We've had three, at least three, I think, clinics, clinicians come here to vaccinate our people on-site. Uh, last week, we announced a new policy, which is mandatory masking uh, at our facilities, unless you can provide proof of vaccination. And that's been, uh, I would say, very well received. We've had a couple of areas where it created a little, uh, a little feedback, but by and large, very well received. And I think, frankly, our, our associates appreciate the fact that we are taking extra steps uh, to protect their uh, their safety. You know, I think we will, uh, we are discussing a long way from making a decision about, uh, you know, a, a more uh, uh, impactful uh, vaccination strategy, mandatory vaccinations, perhaps at some of the manufacturing uh, facilities. We're not there yet. You can imagine the difficulty uh, if you've got, let's say, 30% of your employees, and that's not our precise data, but if you had 30% of your employees uh, vaccinated at a site and you impose a mandatory vaccination order, you essentially would have to shut down uh, your facilities for some period of time, which would be a, a drastic step that we're trying to avoid. So we're doing everything within our power uh, to try to uh, encourage vaccinations uh, and provide positive reinforcement. A couple of other things I'll mention just that we're thinking about. So we uh, had been planning to announce uh, a return to work schedule that would provide a lot of flexibility sometime right after Labor Day. Uh, you know, we're back at work today, but very flexible. And so, uh, you know, people can almost set their own work schedule. Uh, however, uh, uh, we were going to announce something more formal 
uh, along those times. And it would be, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what it would be yet, but it would be, you know, three days in the office, four days in the office with just a lot of flexibility. Uh, you know, we will have to look at that again. I think now, depending on how this Delta variant progresses, uh, we'll have to change all that. And then the other uh, consideration is just the uncertainty around return to school. If that continues to be an issue in terms of uh, how schools reopen, then we'll have to relook at all that. So I guess the message is we're doing everything we can to encourage people to be vaccinated. Uh, and there's just a lot of uncertainty in the business environment, but I've tried to provide a little bit of flavor as to what we're doing and what we're considering. You know, thank you, Mark. When, you know, we're perhaps following your lead a bit here at the partnership, and I'll just share with the group, like you, we now require someone to show proof of vaccination in order to have that benefit of not being required to wear the masks in the office. And that did have the effect of encouraging a few more people to get vaccinated. Here at the partnership, we're up to 93% of our staff now are vaccinated, which puts us at the relatively high end, I think, relative to most communities. Even with that, we're doing what you're suggesting, which is we're looking at, we, we were planning to do around Labor Day, and we've just let our staff know that the step we were planning to take at Labor Day, we're deferring, which is just like you, we were planning to bring more people back into the office on some, you know, two or three days per week schedule. It just, at this point, it doesn't seem to be a, a prudent step to have people in the office even more. And we're having to look, frankly, at, at our protocols relative to the events we're hosting for the general public. Uh, we, have a, we have a number of questions. I had some prepared questions, but I suspect given the questions that have come in through the Q&A feature, and in the time we have remaining, about 15 minutes, we ought to go to those questions. Uh, we'll bring all of our panelists back up on the screen if we could. Uh, thank you all, and James, if you're there. And uh, look to Ben. Uh, uh, Ben's the, the tough question asker. Ben Belson, by the way, is is the vice president for strategy on the partnership staff. And he's been one of the individuals involved in this effort from the beginning, uh, seconded for a long time to the city of Houston. So Ben, what kind of a, what kind of a tough question do you have for Eric? I just write for Eric. I want to go right at the heart. Uh, no, Eric, I was going to go for you first there, Bob, but we'll wait on yours. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of questions here about immunocompromised patients. Uh, what sort of information, you know, it sounds like a lot of folks are sort of in limbo here. The CDC is telling them, to go to their doctor for their advice. The doctors are telling them to listen to the CDC. So what sort of advice or recommendations on getting vaccinated uh, or, or safety precautions that immunocompromised patients should be considering? So first of all, if you are immunocompromised or you've been told by, your, I'll, I'll say if you've been told by your healthcare provider that you may be, um, getting the vaccine is still safe. You still should still get vaccinated. You can then follow up to see if you've, you're actually making antibodies some weeks after. That is, that is a possibility. I would um, encourage those people, you, you can Google Texas Cares COVID, and that would give you basically access to a, a free program across Texas where you can assess your antibodies. In fact, the data that I showed comes from Texas Cares. Um, and see if you've been making antibodies. At this point in time, there are active trials about the effectiveness of a third dose for those of you who may be um, immunocompromised. I think there is not currently a recommendation though for a third dose. I think, we need to, I think we need to differentiate between, because we get these muddled up. There are people that are immunocompromised they're taking chemotherapy uh, that has impaired their immune system. They're on, uh, they're, they have an organ transplant and they're taking medication that impairs their immune system. Dr. Borwinkle is absolutely right. There, there's no danger in taking the vaccine. The danger is because you're immunocompromised that you may not have the same sort of rigorous response to the vaccine you would ordinarily. That is different from having an autoimmune disease, a different thing where your body has a uh, process where it's making antibodies against itself and damaging your nerves or damaging your organs. So if you have an autoimmune disease like lupus, like a history of Guillain-Barre syndrome, in that situation, I would talk to your doctor about the advisability of getting the, getting the vaccine. But those conditions are, are relatively rare, but I would still talk to your doctor. Thank you both for that. Uh, on the, the topic of antibodies, uh, we've got several questions one, how long do we know yet how long antibodies last? And then, uh, well, we'll start with that. Do we know yet how long antibodies last? 
So basically the data that I showed um, is really the best data out there that antibodies to the naturally occurring virus are lasting on average about one year, which I said is, is, is longer than I would have guessed. Um, and, and by the way, I think it's good to remind us that the, the immune system is complicated. There's both an antibody response and a cellular response. So even those people that didn't make antibodies still may have a vigorous cellular response. At this point in time, we really don't know how long, um, an exact estimate, how long the antibodies from the vaccine last. I can tell you some early data with not very large sample sizes also indicate that both the antibody and the cellular immune response are, are lasting a long time. In fact, I just saw a paper yesterday in Cell Medicine for the geeks who wanna look it up um, that are lasting at least 200 days. So if, yeah. if you have antibodies from being exposed or you've had COVID before, mm -hmm. one, do you need to get vaccinated? And two, if, if you have had COVID or been exposed, how long should you wait in order to be vaccinated? So two very different questions. So first of all, if you've had COVID, yes, you still need to get um, vaccinated. The vaccine response is a more robust response. It's stronger. It's, you know... You, you make more antibodies. Um, so yes, please go ahead and get vaccinated. Go ahead and get both doses. Um, Dr. McDivitt may help me on this one with the current recommendation. At one time, it was two weeks after you've had your last positive test, but I don't know what the current- yeah, I, th I think generally, and one way of thinking about it is you could look at the, your infection as being your first dose of vaccine. Uh, so with Moderna, Pfizer, we wait three to four weeks before the second dose. So generally, I'd wait about a month uh, before I got that second dose. Now, early in the pandemic, we were asking people to wait for three months. So you might hear that recommendation, wait three months from the time you were infected. Frankly, the reason for that was there wasn't enough vaccine. So they were trying to prioritize people that didn't have any immunity at all. So I'd wait about a, uh, about a month, but I would still go through the full vaccine sequence and get both doses of the vaccine. On that topic, Jim, you, you mentioned a good point. If someone received their first dose of a vaccine, say in January, February of this year, can they go now to get their second dose or do they have to start all over? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So there is there is really good data. And now, and now keep in mind when the pharmaceutical companies designed these trials and they picked a three month and four month or four week window, they tried to pick the shortest reasonable interval, interval to, to design their trial. So we haven't really tested a lot with longer intervals. There is really good data out there that up to 42 days is absolutely okay. And so if you're separated by 42 days, you are rock solid. You're frankly probably in good shape if you go even longer than that, but we just don't have data to answer that to answer that question. So the right answer is, first of all, today, go get your second dose. Uh, and then you might talk to your doctor. If it's been six months or eight months or been a long, long time, you probably should consider uh, going through the whole thing and, and, and redoing your series. And James, as was mentioned earlier, somebody who's had one dose, hasn't gotten sick, may have just kind of put this out of their mind and thought, well, I'll, I just don't need to go get that second dose. But now with the Delta variant, that's, that's not the right conclusion. Can you speak to that? Absolutely. I said before, if you have one dose of vaccine, uh, you are essentially not immunized against Delta var variant. So you are, you, you are at risk if you only have the one dose. A quick question for you. You mentioned all the great work you and the county have done with our public school districts and in partnership with uh, local community organizations to get the vaccine out there. Uh, what, what in your mind, and we'll turn it over to the other healthcare professionals on the call as well after this, but uh, what can be done to reduce the vaccine hesitancy that we're seeing? You mentioned that you have seen a little bit of a spike here with the Delta variant coming around, but what can be done, especially from the perspective of uh, employers uh, to encourage uh, vaccination and just generally in our community to address the hesitancy issue. So one thing I wanted to mention that right now we have 44% of our total population that's fully vaccinated, which is, is, is just not enough. So, and right now when we talk about the Delta variant, the most cases that we're seeing in Harris County are those between 20 to 39. So they're, they're normally they're the workforce that you guys are probably employing. And so we think that businesses are, can have a huge role in helping us encourage vaccinations, whether it be similar activities like Mark Watts was talking about, 
or even just spreading the, the information that people on this panelist are, pro are providing to the public. Um, I think one of the things that we've seen um, as far as hesitancy, and um, really it's about the family and the friends and trusted people. The health department, the government says to go get vaccinated, that's not working. Um, when the, usually their, um, their medical, you know, their doctor, they tell them they're more inclined to listen to that. But really the family and the friends, whether it's because someone was sick or someone was severely affected by the virus, that unfortunately is having the best result in getting people vaccinated. So we really don't wanna to get to that point where someone's having to experience loss or a family member having sickness to get to that point where they're actually taking the vaccine. So we're, it, we're actually starting some new PSAs um, with some local community you know, leaders and um, significant um, personalities that can can tell the story um, and really get to the people's, um, I guess, hearts and souls to try and get vaccinated. But if we can partner with any of you guys and help you, you know, provide the information that's needed, we'd be happy to do so. Um, and I know that Dr. Borwinkel and Dr. McDevitt probably have some more to answer with that. You know, an example, Jennifer, of friends influencing friends and family influencing family. When we started vaccinating teenagers in schools, we saw that the teenagers could influence their parents. And that gave us a new channel, frankly, of getting the parents to come and get vaccinated. I do think we're at a point now where friends influencing friends, family influencing family may truly be our best vehicle now for getting these, these hesitants to come in. Yeah, I wanted to make that point, particularly in the, the junior high and high school um, peer pressure, and I mean that in a positive way, you know, it's being cool to be vaccinated. We've seen um, school, entire school districts where it is cool to be vaccinated and those vaccination rates in those districts are above 70%. Um, likewise, if we can think about peer to peer discussions about being vaccinated, have somebody who looks like, speaks like, and, and can relate to the daily lives of those that we're talking, you know, t discussing and talking about the vaccine, I think is important. And we should start to think about training sessions for peers or, you know, influencers, so to speak, if you use a cool word today, um, creating influencers that could be active in the business community to help help your employees understand and, and have the time to ask, answer and ask questions about the vaccine. Let me let me say something about kids because I see a lot of it relates to this topic, but I see a lot of questions in the chat about kids and schools and vaccination for kids, et cetera. Uh, first of all, when when can we vaccinate kids? Well, if they're 12 and above now, uh, so go get your teenager vaccinated. 12 or young, younger than 12, uh, Moderna and Pfizer are in clinical trials. We expect that for the upper half of that group, six and above, we'll probably have an available vaccine in the fall. For younger kids, it's going to be longer, probably into next calendar, next calendar year. That's it's coming. Uh, I, I would, I mean, it's a really hard thing. If you read the front page of the Chronicle today, there's a big article on going back to public schools, public schools where, by law, we can't mandate vaccination of staff and we can't mandate masks. Uh, so, and and oh, by the way, the schools won't support virtual learning anymore. So, if you're sending a child back to public school. I mean, what choices do you have? If you can't afford to put your child in private school, if you don't have the resources to homeschool, if you're not going to become truant and just take your kid out of school and don't worry about it, you're going to send them back to school. So that's sort of a difficult position to be putting parents in. I would point to data out of Great Britain. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a good study that ties together a lot of very strong databases in Great Britain. There, there are 12, this is actually in England specifically, 12 million people under the age of 18 in, in England. Uh, of those 12 million people, they had something like 5,000 kids that were admitted to hospitals over, a, I think, an eight-month period, over an extended period of time. Then they looked at attributable deaths of those kids that got into the hospital, how many died, and did they really die of COVID-19? So they went through a very rigorous process to say, of 12 million kids, what was the likelihood of actually dying from COVID-19? And that number was about two in a million. Uh, which is a very, very low uh, number. So I wouldn't advocate this, but I think you're actually okay in sending kids back into environments that feel risky. It's, uh, it doesn't make me happy. It's not my recommendation, but I don't think kids are in imminent peril if, if you're forced to do that. I think a better answer is to try to manage the risk. 
Uh, so to call organizations, ask them the question, how are you protecting my child? What's your stance on vaccination of staff? Can I have a vaccinated teacher? Are you maintaining that masking and distancing? And to the extent you're getting kids into those environments, I would like them at a minimum to be giving me a good answer for how they're keeping my child safe. I think between the, the kids are okay to an organization taking it seriously, I think that's probably the best way for the best balance you can get in terms of mitigating risk at this point. Just one I'm going to add, can I add to that a little bit? Please do. Uh, another thing is don't yell at your principal or school teacher. <laughs> Work with them. Work with them to try to create the very safest and best learning environment possible, not only for your kids, but your neighbor's kids. You know, I, I guess, Bob, you know, we've spent a lot of time with Region 4 and others, and right now they're stressed. They're more stressed this year than last year because they they don't have as many options. Um, they're fatigued. Uh, there's teachers are fatigued. The parents are fatigued. So I think setting up an environment um, across Harris County, and Harris County has shown again and again, often with unfortunately related to rain events that, you know, we, we can rally. And I think this is a place where we need to rally together to create a, a, a productive and safe environment to get back to school. And I think it's everyone's responsibility, not, not just the superintendents or not just the, you know, leaders in the business community. I think all of us need to rally behind this cause. I would add to that something I heard Dr. Borwinkle say earlier today. I mean, school starts just around the corner. It's going to take you three to four weeks to get vaccinated. So this is not something you can wait until you're buying the backpack and the back to shoes, school shoes. You have to go out and get vaccinated today uh, to have time to get fully vaccinated in term, before the school term starts. So maybe that's a good concluding message. I'll, I'll just say our best tool against the Delta variant is to be vaccinated. And to take that percentage, 53% of Harris County residents 12 and over are fully vaccinated. If we can take that percentage up, we can we can beat this thing, but we've got to take it up and we've got to take it up materially. And frankly, we need to take it up quickly. And I appreciate Mark, your comments and, and James, your comments as employers. I think employers need to be given a lot of thought to how they can encourage, motivate, maybe ultimately induce their employees to be vaccinated. Jim, James, you mentioned that uh, B Baylor College of Medicine was gonna go to a mandatory approach here shortly. I think other businesses in Houston will be looking at that as we think about the logistics of doing that. But vaccination is the key, uh, even against the Delta variant, I'd say particularly against the Delta variant, we need everyone fully vaccinated. Uh, let me just say to all of you, Eric, James, Jennifer, Mark, thank you for your time today. Thank you to the audience. Uh, we, we did record this, uh, Ben, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> so I believe we'll have a recording of this available for those of you who joined late or simply want to share it with others. Uh, we would love for this information to get out and uh, really appreciate all of you taking the time, taking the interest. And I uh, look forward to talking to you again, frankly, in the coming weeks, uh, as perhaps we can provide even more guidance to businesses on appropriate next steps. So with that, uh, just remain vigilant. Have a great afternoon. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, Bob. Stay well. Thank you.